Welcome to the Mole Biography Podcast. Today, I'm talking with award-winning street photographer, Brendan O'Shea. Hello, and welcome to the first ever episode of the Mole Biography Podcast. I'm Andy Butler. I'm the founder and editor of Mole Biographer Magazine, which is a digital magazine dedicated to the art of smartphone photography. If you're a follower of Mobiography, you'll probably be aware that we've just launched the first Mobiography Awards, an international photography competition that aims to find the very best mobile photographers from around the world and showcase that work. And unlike many photography competitions, what we're doing is something a bit different in that we are hosting a number of online events, workshops and interviews with talented photographers, artists and app creators. And this podcast will be one of the mediums that we'll be using to showcase the chats and conversations that will be going on over the next couple of months. But for this first episode, uh, our, my guest today is Brendan O'Shea. Now, I've known Brendan for quite a few years now and have had the pleasure of meeting him in person at the Mojo Con and Mojo Fest events in Ireland. And on those occasions, uh, I found it really interesting to see the approach that he takes to the way he shoots and how that approach has changed over the years. Uh, so to give you a bit of background in, on Brendan, he is a multi-award winning fine art street photographer and mobile photographer from Cork. In the past, Brendan has won first place in the iPhone Photography Awards. He has twice been a first place category winner in the Mobile Photography Awards and has also won the Mira Mobile Photography Prize. Uh, he was awarded Best in Show at the Florence International Photography Awards in 2015 and in the same year won the Mediterrano Photo Festival along with first place in the Everyday category in the Stark Awards. Brendan regularly hosts mobile photography workshops in Ireland and his hometown of Cork and um, before COVID could be found delivering workshops and talks around the world, including places such as London, Scotland, Bangkok, Jakarta, Singapore and Hong Kong, to name but a few. But like many things these days, COVID has forced him to put those workshops online. So in this interview, Brendan talks to us about his approach to street photography, how the COVID restrictions has affected his photography and also uh, offers some seasoned advice on what it takes to win a photography competition. So without further ado, let's dive into my conversation with Brendan O'Shea. Hello there, Brendan. How are you today? I'm good, Andy. All <laughs> well over here in a rainy Sunday morning. Is it re oh, the rain's not got to us yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit miserable. Thanks for... Uh, Agreeing to come on uh, the first Mobiography podcast. Hopefully it'll be the first of many and not one of a few. Yeah, we've known each other for quite a few years now. Yeah, yeah. And it's been interesting to see how your work has evolved over the years and actually meeting you in person and seeing how you actually sort of photograph and approach the photographs you take. It's been interesting to see how that, that's evolved. So... Basically, for the people out there that don't know who Mr. Brendan O'Shea is, can you tell us a bit more about your photographic journey and how it was that you discovered smartphone photography? Yeah, um, yeah. thanks for having me on, Andy. As I say, that we know each other a good number of years. We first met back in, I think, 2015 at the first MojoCon. And, you know, that was a very exciting time for me. And yeah, you're right, I think that the way I was shooting and the approach that I had to street photography evolved and changed over the years. I think it's a combination of two things. I think it's a combination of um, curiosity and confidence. And I think that um, street photography is something, you know, it's a, it's a genre of photography that, you know, kind of really requires you to be um, brave and also confident and assured in you know your objective and task about wanting to you know to create images of what you're encountering on the street. I think the process is you know when I look back at it, it's kind of um, an organic, and I can see the the, the evolution you know kind of um, very very natural in its in its form. That initially with candid photography, you're trying not to get caught. Let's put it that way. 
And then, you know, that the curiosity becomes greater than from being observing, you want to move to a stage to engaging. And around, I think, 2017, when the 7 Plus came out, that with the portrait um, mode and the uh, portrait lens that they had on the iPhone, that I was just absolutely fascinated by what it could do and that the results that I could get. And I gradually and then very quickly shifted to um, not, 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 you know, kind of abandoning candid photography because I really love uh, candid street photography still. But, you know, that if there was somebody on the street who got my attention and looked like an interesting character, I, you know, was really eager to jump in front of them, tell them who I was, what I was doing, and, you know, to engage with them, learn about them, and all the while, you know, taking their their, their, their portrait. And it's been a magnificent um, journey in that. Um, that regard that I went on and did um, probably what was the highlight of my photography career, if you want to call it that, back in 2018 that I did a project here in Ireland on um, fans who go to the Irish sport of hurling, which is, you know, kind of um, Irish people would be very passionate about. And I went over 16 weeks to 19 games or 19 games over 16 weeks. I keep getting confused with those. And it was a long-term project over a whole a whole season meeting the fans and getting their stories. And I think that like I used a number of cameras on the project, but the one that I was most comfortable with and the one that got the best results was the was the iPhone, definitely. Yeah. So it's been a, a fantastic experience. And I'm, you know, did, looking did, forward to yeah. Did you notice the difference between using the iPhone and uh your is it Fuji or your Nikon? Fuji. Yeah. Was there a, a definite reaction that people gave you? Uh, between the cameras, or was it just the fact that the smartphone, the iPhone, was just just a lot more covert and natural in in, in the way that you were shooting? Yeah, like I remember, I was in um, I was in Bali one time with a friend of mine, uh, Gatho uh, Sabrot, who's a excellent photographer, and we were on the street together. And after we had you know kind of engaged with people, and I'd been you know taking their their portraits, he said to me, he, pa- he passed the comment, oh, I, see, I, I see what you do now, I see what you do now. You start off with the with the iPhone, and when they get relaxed, then you use the, the Fuji. And I don't think I was ever as deliberate as, as that in terms of seeing the iPhone as less intrusive and kind of, you know, kind of a, a, warm, a warmer up, so to speak. But I think, you know, to answer your question, I think people, yeah, that um, it's not as... You know, kind of intrusive to use that word again when you hoist a big camera up in front of something and you block your face looking through the, the, the viewfinder. Like the great thing with the iPhone, it's that the, the device that you're using, they have also in, in their pocket. And it's because you're looking at the, the live view, you're not blocking your face. And I think that that relaxes people a, a bit in, uh, in portrait photography. And it also creates a little bit of curiosity in terms of, you know, like, how are you shooting on that? That's not a real camera. And I think that, that as well, relaxes um relaxes people like when i brought that project uh, heart to hurling project in 2018 brought it to exhibition it was very funny that the opening night in the um the hunt museum in, in limerick it was you know, there was a, a journalist from the local uh, newspaper there and i was giving him a tour of the uh, of the photographs on uh, on display and we were about to say me a third of the way into it and he stopped and made a comment to me and he said he said yeah he said when, when you look at these photographs, you can really, you know, that understand that the idea that anybody who's got an iPhone or other smartphone that makes them a photographer, that just is not true. <laughs> and I had to say to him that, well, actually, the majority of the photographs on display are shot with an iPhone. <laughs> and what had been a very, you know, kind of lively conversation that we had in the first third wasn't as uh, lively for the next two thirds, you know, when he kind of realizes full power. But yeah, I think going back to it, I think the iPhone um, and shooting on smartphone, I think that there's a number of things at play which make people more relaxed. And I think it's that, you know, it, 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 it isn't the traditional um, hoisting the camera to your face, blocking your face, so then that there's kind of a detachment with the, the, the subject that you're uh, shooting. And I think it's just, there's a curiosity like that, wow, he's using an iPhone. I've got one of those. You know, and then when you show them the results, they're, you know, delighted with it. You know, absolutely delighted. And the fantastic thing then that, like, what I used to do with that project was, 
you know, that I was getting people's stories. So it was like a combination of telling their stories visually and also, you know, with uh, the text. So I would need to get their their names and you know uh, various things like that. And the easiest way to do it was to pass the phone over to them. I would kind of um, say to them, like, will I email you the photo? Yeah, yeah, delighted. So I passed the phone over. They put in their email address and instantly they have the photograph or photographs in many cases that I'd been shooting just, um, you know, seconds earlier and that was I, I, I like that's what made the the project so magical in terms of that the engagement that you'd have and there was an immediate connection and that you could you know pass over the the work to them and you know that people came back to me and you know were saying like you know the photographs that 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 i got they had never got with the with their um you know with their families before and that was a, a wonderful experience yeah i mean uh, how when you take him over uh, a direct approach to people approaching strangers and asking can i take your portrait it, it, it's often something people shy away from uh, i'm quite an introvert so it's something that is something that makes me sort of step back and think twice but how do you approach how do you go about approaching strangers and um generally is it the reaction generally been a, a positive one yeah, so to answer the final part of the question first, that in that project, um, like again, I went to 19 matches or so, and I, two times people said no to me. And if you think about when people are going to sports events, they're you know kind of in a heightened sense of anticipation and nervousness, and you know they want they don't want any distractions. They just want to get to the game, get to the stadium. But you know, people were super kind and responsive to me. Um, I think that you know. I think with, with with portraits and, you know, when you're engaging with people in, in, in public, I think, again, I always go back to, you know, when people ask me about street photography and, you know, how to, you know, do you ever have negative uh, encounters and that? And I always tell them that the first, people's first reaction is never anger. It never is. The first reaction is always curiosity. And so like that, when I jumped out in front of people, you know, that immediately you did, you did, you did a short window of time to get their um, approval and to get their 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 attention. And, you know, simple things like just, you know, smiling, telling them who I was. I used to, to show them the Instagram for the project and um, tell them about myself. And I found, you know, so like that, I think that when, like, if you think about portraits, or portraits, you're, you're getting somebody to portray someone's character. And what you're looking for is like kind of this little revelation in, in a kind of a very, very short window of, 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 of time. And that I found what works for me is that when I initially tell them, you know, why I've stopped them, what it is about them that has, you know, that caught my uh, visual attention. And then I begin to tell them a little about myself. So then I put it on to me first before putting it back on to, yeah. to them. And I think, you know, again, it's, it's always, you know, like people would stand back and they're kind of, you know, curious and yeah, yeah, sure. Like, and I begin to snap away and I begin to tell them stories about myself. And using that as a starting point, then to get to to to, to get their their stories, and um, yeah, like I I, th I think you know that I come from like an education background. I'm twenty five, twenty six years, um, you know, in in a classroom meeting, you know, that meeting with students, engaging with people, and you know, particularly that you know, because I'm a, a language teacher, so a lot of what I would um, do would be kind of communicative strategies. So I would you know be quite um, quite competent as you know stepping in front of people and engaging them and yeah. it, it works it works it works quite quite, quite well yeah yeah all right with regard to the street photography because you've got many different styles uh, as you look through your uh, portfolio on instagram what are the things that you're looking for when you're out sort of wandering the streets what what are the things that grab your attention is it I, is it light is it composition is it a person is it something about oh, a situation i think i think it's all of those i think you know that um you know the way that you introduced the question there that i've got a lot of various um styles and that i often kind of you know question myself and think that if i kind of move towards a more singular signature in terms of photography that i might be you know be better off but when i'm out you know i'm very very open to whatever gets my visual att visual attention so like i think light is the is the, is the main one that if there if there's good light i know there's going to be good um, opportunities and i think that in recent um years i've probably been working more with kind of light and shadow and the interplay with um with, with two of those and then i'm looking for 
um, interesting characters, interesting um, faces, gestures, backgrounds, backdrops. And um, yeah, everything I'm very, very open to. It's, it's not like I'm not, you know, trying to get, you know, one type of photography. You know, and I, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, that I maybe I should kind of narrow things down at, at, at this stage, you know. But um, yeah, light is everything, really. How, how many photographs do you take generally when you're out? Um, so like the last photo walk that I went on was here in Cork in city centre. And um, I was I bought a Fuji X100 recently and I was just uh, road testing that. And it was off maybe about two hours. I probably would shoot. I think anything up to maybe 100, 150 photos. Yeah, and out, and out of those, how how many would you say were keepers? Um, it depends how you define a, a keeper. Like that, <laughs> there's so like that from that batch, there was maybe one that I posted to Instagram. Yeah, or two because I posted it was kind of an abstract one that I posted to my other account as well. So like if, if the the ratio, if I get like usually what I'm looking for is that. It, Within a calendar year, if I've got twelve good photos, I'm happy. Yeah, but to get to that twelve good photos, you know, you could be talking thousands. Yeah, because I think sometimes that people can find that you know it's a bit disheartening uh, in the fact that ah, you're going out. You you see, you just see, you look at all these feeds on Instagram, uh, and you see the cream of the crop, and it, it's not you. It's the other ninety percent of the photographs that the people are taking to sort of get that cream of the crop. Yeah, uh, that's like you know, as I say, it's it's photography is ninety nine percent frustration, and yeah. that it's it's when patience meets luck. Yeah, that's what I would put it down to, and it's it's particularly in in street photography because there's so many things outside your control that you can't you know that you can't ask somebody to make that gesture again. You can't ask them to walk back into the the light. You, you, you can't control those things, and you know. The, the expression street photography as well that when you see it it's too late and it usually is that you notice something bloody hell i, I missed the I missed the opportunity but um i think it's like anything you know that the, the more you do the, the more opportunity you have to get better uh, photographs but i think it's i think for people i think it's a good thing to understand that when you're looking through the feed of anybody on on instagram like that for for the one photograph that they're posting i would say that there's at least multiples of you know in some cases hundreds that yeah. they're not posting you know and that it's just it's a, it's a frustrating but ultimately very rewarding and fun endeavor when it, yeah. when, it, when it does work yeah i mean as a street photographer how how have you found lockdown over the past year because it, it um, really does limit the opportunities that that are available to you doesn't it but I think the main thing that it limited was, um, I think that you know that with the with the pandemic and with the kind of the, the rushed progression into into lockdown, I think you had a situation where everybody was experiencing similar emotions, and that you know to contrast it in pre COVID times that if you went out on the streets that that just wouldn't be the case that there would be people would be experiencing a whole you know spectrum of of human emotions and that's what yeah. made it very interesting. To, to photograph and to encounter and to find that on the on, on the street like i remember back in maybe march or april i cycled into the city center here in cork you know with the intention that you know this is a historic moment and you know that i could get photographs that would um, tell the story of the time but i took maybe one or two photographs but i just couldn't couldn't do it because i felt that um I felt it was really intrusive. I think that the, the the atmosphere and the kind of emotions that were evident that people were experiencing were the same ones that I had, which was fear and trepidation and unknown. And that it it I wasn't an observer that I would be usually in, in street photography scenario, that I was yeah. more of a, a participant. And I just felt, you know what, this isn't for for me. It's not something that I want to... You know, because I think that there's the photography is very subjective, and there's a separation from the view from the photographer and what they're um, you know shooting. But in that instance, I found that no, no, it's 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 not something that I I, I was comfortable with. It's not something that I had an attachment with that was necessary to be able to, to, to an emotional attachment. I think is necessary to, to for uh, some of the things you're sh- shooting on on the on the street. So I think probably from March until maybe. August, 
like we went to visit uh, my brother and his family up in Dublin in about August. We went into the city centre in Dublin. Like, and you've been to Dublin. It's a you know yeah. big European capital city. It's really busy. You know, it's got a you know, um, you know, kind of a population of one point five million. It's, but we went up there, and streets were deserted, and you know, shops were closed, restaurants closed, bars were closed, and no, it wasn't something that I wanted to. It, it gave me no that like that. I suppose when you're on the street, there's an energy. There's a uh, yeah. I know. was about to say there's um. It, it's like the energy that you feed off as a street yeah, photographer definitely. all of a sudden isn't there. So in a way, I suppose you've got to change your mindset. Yeah. No, I couldn't. There was nothing really that you know that 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 energy that would kind of you know kickstart you and you know get into the the zone and you know that you're you know as as I would be kind of electrified by the. You know the, the the visual dynamics going on around me, and um, so I've done very little. I've gone out a few times with my my daughter and uh, some sometimes into the city centre, and it's been more to take. Like there's been new uh, street art gone up in in our city centre, which is brilliant, and I've been taking photographs of that. But as to get back to, pardon me, as to get back to a, a, a stage where I really think it is like that, we have to move beyond um, COVID, and that there has to be you know, um, not a collective predominant emotion that um, kind of COVID, that prevails with COVID at the, at the moment to, to make it yeah. more um, kind of emotionally um, interesting for me. To, to yeah. yeah. Um, you A while back, you wrote an article for the uh, Mobile Pre magazine uh, about mindfulness and that, that touches mm-hmm. on getting into the zone. Could you tell us a bit about what you mean about mindfulness? with photography um so like i think mindfulness people's understanding is you know that it's something that you do silently on your own you close your eyes and you know put your feet in the ground and begin to drown out all distractions and concentrate on your breathing which um does not work for me at all it just you know i get assaulted by thoughts when i try to, to do that but again, it's just a reflective thing. It's, you know, that I think that a lot of, you know, what we do is we do it kind of inst- instinctively. And then when we stop, we realize, wow, actually, you know, when I'm out shooting and, um, you know, risking my life at times to get, to get, to get a photograph, I realize that I'm in a very zoned in center and a situation, you know, and like, I think, you know, again, pre-COVID is to travel to Tokyo each year, which was, you know, app, but, you know, extremely privileged to be able to have that opportunity to shoot in the streets in Tokyo. And I would find that, you know, there would be so much happening in my immediate surroundings that I would be completely, you know, hyper concentrated on what was visually engaging uh, with me and that, you know, getting the photographs, it could be, it could be a period of, let's say, you know, 30 seconds that I observe something and I want to get the photograph. And for that 30 seconds, I'm, totally immersed in it or it could be you know i don't i I can't put a time in it but it could be a period of maybe let's say 10 15 20 minutes that i'm in a location with so much activity and all i'm in in, 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 you know immersed in is you know trying to capture within a little frame the what 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 i'm countering in the streets and then it's after when i would kind of step from it and maybe i'd look around and realize that there's so many things that um you know that I wasn't aware of as the same. That, yeah. that, that that's the, the you know the, the contradiction in, in terms of in, I'm so immersed in it, but also when I step back when I realize, wow, there's so much else as, as well. And then the editing side of it, you know, that I find the editing side of it to be very um, calming, and again that I kind of relive in the moments, and then I, I'm then kind of faced with more um, you know kind of challenged with more kind of aesthetic possibilities and potentials with the with the editing. But that I find that it's 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 full immersion. It's it it it's great. You know? It's absolutely great. I think that if 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 photography was taken from me, it would leave a void in my life, which I can't imagine how it, how how it yeah. would. It's so, so important to me. Yeah, I just want to touch on your workshops that you yep. uh, host. Uh, you've been doing those for a number of years now, haven't you? About six years, yeah. Yeah. Could you tell us more about those? And um, yeah, what- the workshops. Like I suppose they've changed very much in the past um, year or so because everything has gone online. And like I used to say, like that you know, 
workshops and photography in, in a classroom is like trying to learn how to swim in a classroom that, you know, you have to get out, you have to put it into practice. And with the, um, the face-to-face workshops we used to do, yeah, we was kind of, it was a 50-50 split between, you know, kind of in the classroom and then getting out and shooting, which is fantastic. Shifting online, um, I was, was thinking, how could this be done online? But there's, there's, there's great resources, technology, technological resources available to, you know, kind of to make the process um, very engaging for, for, for participants. And it also allows people to, you know, be remotely located. So like, the, you know, on some of the workshops I have, that are people from Australia, from the States, from Spain, UK, and, and of course, Ireland. And it's, it's brilliant um, in, in that regard. And um, I've gotten much better in terms of structuring it and allowing, you know, um, photo walks to take place. So like in, if, if, if there was a two hour session, there would be time for people to, you know, to get away from the screen and yeah. just in their immediate surroundings, you know, with, with a bit of guidance and kind of um, exemplification to give them opportunities to take photographs in their immediate surroundings, then give them tasks. If it's the longer workshops that I do, give them tasks each week and we have um uh, you know, kind of private Facebook groups where I get feedback to the feedback to the photographs that they they post. But it's the, the like again. So like I come from an educational background. You know, like a teacher for as I said about twenty five, twenty six years, and then combining it with a passion for photography, it's it's a fantastic. You know, it's it's it's. it's I really really get a, a kick out of it. I enjoy doing it. I was doing a project last year over the summer, I think six weeks or so, with um you know senior citizens here in, in, in Ireland and who were there, you know, experiencing the, the, the lockdown mm-hmm. and, you know, that they, you know, that expressions that come into the lexicon that everybody's familiar with things like here in Ireland is within your 2K or within your 5K. So that yeah. all you could um, travel was in two kilometers or five kilometers. So like that, people were doing the same route, going for a walk every day. And to see they, they did what they were able to achieve in terms of it being able to see differently when they go out shooting and for them to report back to me that i had helped them to trans visually transform what they were seeing every day that they were seeing it with no, new eyes and actively seeking out fo- uh, photographs it's 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 it, 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 it's it's lovely it's absolutely beautiful to, to, to you know to experience that and like that you know, like one. Of, I remember one of one of the uh, women on it. You know, she's quite, quite, quite an elderly woman. I don't think she mind me saying that, but she posted photographs one night from the car park in Lidl, where she where she lives. And I honestly, like when I looked at Facebook with them, I was just blown away because the first of all, the ability to actually see what she saw. You know, because that it was that she was in the car. It had been raining and now the sun was um, was shining so that you had the kind of um, contrast in the light between the you know the puddles of water and the light uh, coming through and also to, to, to sh- she shot through the the window frame with with with, with the um, with the lights but there was the like with little you know the yellow and the blue yeah of the of the little colors like so they were they were in it that you had it was just one of the most magnificent photographs I ever saw and it was this was somebody who was like. Um, unable to get out of her car because it was raining, yeah. and like before this, you know, course or whatever, she probably would have just sat there, you know, looking at the phone or whatever. But now she saw it. this is an opportunity to get a photo, and the consideration and the curiosity that went into the the, the composition to get the result that she did, I uh, just it was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. Superb competitions. You've you've won many competitions over the years. Lost a lot too. <laughs> yeah. what what are your views and experiences with them i think competitions are absolutely fantastic like i think you know that people you know they will talk about that you know that photography shouldn't be a competitive uh, pursuit yeah that's all fine but it, people by nature are competitive that we want to you know we want to benchmark ourselves against um, who we perceive to be the the best in things, we want we want feedback and validation, and I think competitions are a great way to achieve that. And like I remember, for me, that back in like when I got into iPhone photography back in two thousand and twelve, you know that it was the Mobile Photography Awards, and this was the annual assessment. Submit the photographs, and you know initially to get honourable mentions, like it was hugely hugely rewarding because again it just you know. It was a process of work that I was going through within a year and trying to get the um, 
you know, kind of um, a set of photographs that I could, could submit, and then to see the validation that they got um, honorable mentions, in, like in 2012, 2013, 14, was fantastic. And then to win, um, you know, to be a category winner and, you know, to be up for the grand prize uh, photographer, which I never got, which, uh, um, well, I'll, I'll always regret, but we won't we won't go down that 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 route. But then to win other competitions like the iPhone Photographer of the Year in the IPPAs, Mira, and and that fabulous. I think you know that you know people should you know see what photography is. Photography is 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 a it's a it's a it's, a, it's fun. It's a hobby, and competition is always part of uh, of of you know of, of things that 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 you, that you do. So yeah, I think competitions are, yeah. are great. Yeah, I mean, we've been working together with our friend Glenn on a yeah, yeah. mutual project which will be running by the time this yeah. this episode goes out uh, the mobiography awards what um what do you think makes a winning photograph what should people that are entering competitions be thinking about when they're narrowing down and trying to choose it's the best that, photo a, that they've got yeah yeah that's a very difficult question to to answer, and I think that if there was if there was a kind of a definitive answer to it, the competition probably would close quite quickly. <laughs> that I think you know that I think that when when people are entering photographs, and I think it's very easy to select a batch of photos. So you yeah. can say that okay, I'm going to enter. And I think in any competition that you're entering, you know, you're not going to enter just a single image. You're going to enter, you know, like if you're serious about winning it, you're probably going to enter maybe about ten. If you want to win a category, you're going to enter maybe about five or something like that. So you might easily select, let's say for street photography, you might easily select 10 of your best street photos. I think then when you're looking at them, you have to see, okay, that are they, are those 10 representative of, of my work or is there kind of um, repetition and duplication? Is there just different variations of the same photograph? So like, for example, is it like, you know, that is it a character, okay, kind of classic example, a character just walking past an interesting background. So like if you look at the photograph up there, but if you had three photographs like that, then it's, you know, the, you're, you're reducing your chances because it's uh, ultimately, it's just a variation of the same type of phot photograph. So I think like you're, you're trying to see something which can, you know, that pr represent your style of photography in its strongest form. And then when you're thinking about what can be a winning photograph, I think that, you know, in, in like, I, I, I tend to look at photographs for, for my own and think, are, are there, I'm looking, are there three elements in the photograph? So like, let's say, is there, is there good light? Okay, is there good uh, composition? And is there some, let's say, human emotion evident in it? So like, is there like, you know, that, you know, that it's, it's there's not just kind of, you know, um, a one dimensional um, kind of aspect of it, that there's more to the photograph. So, um, you know, I think that, Again, you know, it's like it was like I've entered a lot of competitions through the years. I've also been a judge in a lot of a lot of competitions, and I know that the judging process is, you know, the ones that I've been on is is, is quite thorough, and that there's a lot of you know to and froing between the judges to ensure that the the cream does uh, you know rise to the the top. But I think if you look at winning photographs, I think that there's always something you know kind of maybe fresh in the composition, and some something you know that there's good good kind of technical use. But I don't think it's that important. But like you can see that it's a craft in what, what what was done, and that there's some human emotion that is challenged or altered by the by, by viewing it. You know. I was going to ask you about your plans for the rest of this year. Are COVID restrictions limiting you to travel? Because I know in the past you've travelled a lot. Yeah. So um, yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely still limiting ability to travel like that um you know to be able to go up to dublin to visit family will be an, like an exotic holiday honest. yeah <laughs> you know this is probably the longest that i've been in in cork for oh since i was a child i'd say without um without leaving um that i've been invited to go to the street photography thing on in istanbul in october it was cancelled a few times and that's um probably the next trip that i would um fingers crossed uh, go on and like yeah that you know when like, again pre-covid look back and but you think what you used to take for granted you know to be able to you know travel a few times a year and get to in different locations yeah that was just 
incredible, you know. So it's like when it does come back with the travel, and when I'm, you know, stuck in a long queue in an airport or that, I won't be yeah. complaining. I won't be complaining, <laughs> you know. No. Probably will be. Jesus, I probably will be complaining. Yeah. The rest of, like, you know, but, but you know what I mean? I think that um, I'd be very happy to at the same time, but like I, I enjoy complaining. So. Yeah. Well, thanks for um, speaking to us today. Just before we round up, where can people find out more about your workshops and what's coming up next? I think the easiest way is through um, Instagram. I suppose Instagram is where I would um, be most um, active and Instagram then would link to the, the website and that. But So it's brendan.o.se. Brilliant. Okay, then, well, we'll be speaking again soon, but uh, thanks for your time today. And thank you, Andy. Yeah. Always a pleasure. I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing you face-to-face -face soon <laughs> when, this, when this is over, yeah? Thank you. See you. Good Bye. Stuff. Good stuff. Thanks, Andy. I'd just like to give a shout out to Loom Touch, who are the sponsors for this podcast and the awards. If you've not come across Loom Touch before, they are the guys behind the apps Loom Fusion and Loom FX, which are two leading video editing apps for mobile. So if you want to take your mobile video editing to the next level, head over to loom-touch.com.